Went down the wrong pipe. Mm. All right, so I see the live button. That means we're good? Yeah. We'll get. <laughs> and I was looking for the uh, volume. Oh, look, see, I'm learning. The volume thing's working, too. There you go. So uh, good evening, everyone. It is 6, 6 p.m. How about that? That's pretty good timing. Uh, so, yeah, so so good evening. Um, this is our second session today of, of Chat with the Chief. So basically what we try to do is just provide a form or venue that we're able to have conversations, some question and answer back and back and forth, um, ideas or, or really anything, right? Um, how we how we got to this point, uh, our media relations department here and the police department talked about using technology to branch out a little bit, to share information, to uh, interact with the community, uh, especially during COVID, right, when, when things were kind of shut down, it was a way for me to open up and inter interact and ask any questions that, that you all might have, and then vice versa. So uh, I wasn't really sure uh, how it would take off, but it seems like it has been beneficial. Um, Vanessa, how are you? It's good to have you here tonight. Um, so long story short, I know things get crazy. Everybody's trying to do so much in so short a time and things with kids and family, and I get that. So we do two of these uh, a month. One at one o'clock, one at twelve o'clock, and one at six o'clock. So we open it up a little bit different. Um, so it's just a chance for me to have some interaction. Uh, just hitting some, some, I guess some, a little bit of the factors. If someone asks me a question about an active case, I'll be as open and transparent as I can, but I don't want to go too far to hurt or, or cause any issues with the case. Um, but it, but I, you know we will try to be as open and transparent with each other as we can. Uh, we may not always agree on some conversations we have, but that's all right. It, it's good that we're able to sit down and talk talk with each other, and I appreciate that. So last thing I'll say before I start uh, giving some hellos is if I miss a post that comes through, because I'm the least technical person you'll ever meet, but I understand how important technology is. But if the screen jumps a little bit because posts keep coming in, we'll try to scroll back. But if I miss one, it, it, judge it to my heart. Not, not It's not intentional. Sarah's with me tonight again, making sure I don't touch anything. Mess. Is that plant new? There's a little plant here. For, let me just show. It. So we got a we got a little plant here for scenery. Calm, right? Oh. But uh, <laughs> that's really nice. But I I appreciate uh, Vanessa. Thank you for being here. Michael, uh, it's a great question. I get right to you, Carrie. Thank you for being here. I appreciate that. Uh, Annie, um, hi, Chief Sarah, and I hope you all. Hi, Annie. Sarah says hello and thank you for joining us. Uh, this evening. Uh, Michael, any update on the 7-Eleven double homicide? Um, if you're not familiar, that is the case at the 7-Eleven at Killing Creek. Two individuals uh, lost their life there, uh, a shooting that occurred inside the, the, the business in, uh, there. Uh, I, I, there's, I, I, we talked a little bit about this this afternoon, so that's a great question. It lets me know that you're definitely informed of things going on. Um, one of the best homicide detectives we have is working that case. Uh, she has done a phenomenal job. We are not getting the same number of leads and calls that we did originally. So I will again put out a plea that if anyone knows anything or thinks they know anything or might have heard anything, or even if they feel or think something uh, about, that, about that double shooting, double murder, to please let us know. Uh, I will tell you that we are still uh, following up on leads that we've had or information that comes through no matter how small it is you know a crime scene or a crime is like a puzzle and there's these bits and pieces that all fit together to form a, a final picture so it could be that one piece that we're just missing that links everything else together uh, but has there been an arrest no um, i can't tell you or i can't share anything about some of the leads that we're looking at or or persons of interest or locations i don't want to hurt anything but I can tell you that case is still um, active, it's still being investigated. But I will share that we are not getting the same number and that amount of tips that have come in. Um, but the case will stay active until it's solved. And I will just say this, Mike, before we move on, that when I went to the scene uh, that night, uh, my heart broke for that family. Uh, and then when we did our community walk, I was overwhelmed by the number of turnout of citizens who came out to walk the neighborhoods with us. Uh, it was clear that that community cared about those two individuals 
and those two individuals certainly had an impact on that community. So I would just ask if anybody knows anything or heard anything or believes anything, has any feelings about something that occurred that night, vehicle, uh, individual, someone that made threats or comments, someone who saw something, uh, to please to please let us know. That's a, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, Mike, thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay, so I'm going to scroll back up just for all of them. I get it. The other. All right. Hi, Chief. The 13 News here. We are wondering if you can uh, offer an update on the Ashante alert of Mr. James Allen. Uh, he was last seen missing on August, but you were able to tell us about the circumstances are which let determine he is critically missing uh, or in danger. Additionally, why was there no missing persons flyer on? Uh, Mr. Allen in mid-August. Thank you. So we'll share a little bit with you. Um, missing persons report, uh, when that was filed, we kind of have to rely on someone to file that before we're really alerted. Uh, we're trying to track down some of that information. And there might be some concern. Uh, 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 I think some individuals, maybe we should have said something sooner, uh, but they're looking at that. As far as going into the specifics of why we issued the Ashanti alert. The only thing I can say, and I, I did just get briefed about an hour ago, kind of update on where we were at. So uh, I really appreciate you covering it, but um, I can't go much into more more details at this point yet. I can tell you that um, information along with uh, maybe some photographs and, and other things uh, led us to believe that there were the individual may be in danger, that there's some circumstances surrounding that by some interviews that were conducted, um, and of course some time frames. Um, and, and while I'm here, let me, let me just say that if anyone ever feels that a family member or someone is missing or endangered, uh, the sooner you let us know, uh, the better. I, I, it just always is better to be cautious uh, than I'm not sure, should I, but, but you know, what's important now is that we find him. Um, and I don't want to go much further than that. I know the detectives are actively doing some searches and doing some things with uh, social media. We'll be looking, uh, doing some things through technology as well. And I'll probably get another briefing in the morning or tomorrow afternoon, maybe even through the evening. I'm going to be here a little bit late today. So, um, yeah, I, I, that, that's all. And I know that may not be as much as you like, but I don't want to hurt anything. And there's some things that are in the works right now as we talk. So I just don't want to. I don't want to go too far into that, um, but it was it was information that we uncovered in once the report was filed, and once there was contact made, um, uh, in, in some in some interviews that we've had, and, and some concerns, um, and some evidence that we've recovered. So uh, it's just important that we find him at this point and, uh, and stay vigilant in, in, in trying to do so. Uh, but that's a great question, and I appreciate that. Um, it has a I think about the plant. Oh, the, the plant has a camera in it? Oh, okay. All right. Rich, it could be. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Annie, uh, okay, we got that. We got uh, plant for Zen. Uh, that's exactly what it is, Annie. I think it's to set the, set the tone for the evening, right? Yeah. Kim, thank you for being here. I appreciate that. Uh, Miss Brumfield, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Uh, Denby area. Is that? Did I miss that? That's okay. Well, that's good. I mean, that means posts are coming through. That's good. Charlotte, hello from Denby area. Uh, Miss McCann, thank you for being here. I appreciate that. Carrie, I didn't know if I acknowledge you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Uh, I think about you know, double almost every day. We need we need more investigations on this. We need more investigations. I, I will tell you what we need is individuals who know something to come forward. Um, just about every resource we had has been involved. And I, and I will tell you, it's a great, you know, it, it is extremely sad. Um, but we invested uh, about a year and a half ago, we really started invested, investing in some things that could help us with technology um, without going too, too far down that rabbit hole um, that has really enhanced um, evidence recovery and, and, and information obtained uh, but but it would be very very beneficial for individuals who who may know some things to come forward and, and you know it's like that in a lot of cases sometimes it's it's what we 
individuals are just a little hesitant, and I understand that. I, I do. There's ways to to share information though without. You know, I'm not asking you to stand out with a sign and I saw this or I heard this. I'm just asking you to contact the police department and let us have some conversation. But um, I would I will tell you there have been a lot of resources as there should be uh, poured into that case as in any case. Um, there's been some recent homicide cases that have been cleared by arrest and there's some really good traction on other ones. Uh, but, but the double murder at 7-Eleven has been hard for everybody. Um, it is tough and it is very sad. It's very, it, it was, I'm telling you that certainly night meeting the family um, as would be expected. But the following day, that, that community walk that we went on in the area, just the outpouring of, of citizens was, it was, there was a really special relationship with those individuals and individuals who live in that community. Uh, it's okay. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Richard, uh, greetings again from upstate New York. Keep up, well, Richard. Thank you, my friend. I hope hope you all are safe up there and in uh, in in New York. I saw the uh, Mets just made the playoffs. Um, so good, <laughs> good for them. But I, I appreciate you turning in, uh, t- turning in. I appreciate you t- tuning in, sir, and I appreciate you. Kim, um, I understand the searches at the high school, but will we as parents be notified as to why the searches were done, i.e. active threats? So help me a little bit. Uh, Are you talking about uh, uh, searches that were recent or uh, are we talking about there was some some spoof calling or some swatting calling going on around the region, Uh, some activity at some schools talking about some threats? Uh, that they were able to determine pretty quick uh, that they, they were false calls. But are you talking about that? Or when you say um, uh, uh, yeah, we're talking about uh, something that just recently, just help me a little bit, make sure I'm understanding uh, what you're asking me about searches at the schools and, and being notified. Now, I will tell you that the school system, school system, the school system, uh, I met with the school board earlier this year over the summer. Uh, we did a lot of training about active shooter type uh, awareness and threats, that type thing. Uh, and, and the school was working on a system about making notifications. If that's what you're asking about, I think there's some th- things in place. I don't want to speak uh, for the schools, uh, but they have a, like almost like a tier model. And that was one of the things they talked about was effectively communicating. Um, but I want to make sure that's what you're asking me. Um, how could we meet you, Chief, if, if we wanted a picture or just to say thank <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what. If you, uh, if you call down call down to the police headquarters and, and um, the police department and talk about just send down and, and talk with the chief, they will get that scheduled. Uh, my assistant's pretty good at that. Uh, she keeps that booked for me in count. She keeps it tight, though. I <laughs> think she keeps it booked. But, uh, but we can always, you know, times that citizens want to sit down and have a conversation, we'll make time for that. I'll make time for that. Uh, Andy, thank you. I appreciate that. I, you know, it's funny on that post there, Andy's post says, you know, uh, prayers that, that, that he is found safe. I, I will tell you, I cannot explain how important it is or the number of, of emails or calls that come in. Chief, there's a message that this church group is praying for you or praying for the city, praying for the officers, praying for this case. Um, so I will tell you, I'm a man of faith, and I think there's a lot of power in prayer. And, and, and just the support that the community gets and to see people praying for others, I just think that's phenomenal. So I, I appreciate that, Andy. That means a lot. Uh, Matt, I was, told by, I was told by police close to the deceased that it was an organized hit because the guy could. Yeah, Matt, so I, I don't know you were told by oh, people close to the deceased. Um, so, Matt, I don't know if you talked to... Uh, Detective Rogers or not, if you haven't, we probably could arrange that. I, I don't want to get into any any motive of speculation. I will tell you, there were several rumors floating around, uh, and I'm not discrediting discrediting anything, uh, but it might be uh, if you'd heard something like that, we could certainly set up at least a phone conversation with you and Detective Rogers. Um, I'm just not, you know, we got to be careful about rumors, but I understand you, you very clearly said it was uh, someone that was close, so. Uh, I just I just wish I knew more. I wish we knew more. Uh, I know there's a lot of speculation about several different things, several different theories. Um, 
and that's one of the frustrating parts is not knowing what the true motive was. Uh, let's see. For me, I love true crime. I love watching families get justice. How would you go about becoming a homicide detective? Well, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, in law enforcement, I would encourage anyone who wants to get into the field to come and spend some time, maybe do a ride along first off and see if you like being in that car and go, hearing that radio, the calls for service and responding to calls, interacting with people and citizens. Uh, but to answer your question you know, very, very directly, um, you join the police department, you go through the academy, you spend time in patrol. That's where everybody starts to kind of learn the fundamentals of the police work. Um, then you advance. There's a special victims unit that deals with uh, crimes against children. Uh, a lot of our domestic violence is under special victims. Um, elderly abuse, missing person, runaways. We start doing those basic investigation. Um, but those are also some of the hardest cases that impact the heart the most. You do a lot with crimes against children. Um, juvenile crime, uh, those type things. The next then is, is aggravated assault. That's dealing with our shootings, stabbings, and, and bad assaults, bad beatings, and cause you know, bodily injury and hospitalization, and, and then homicide. So there is there is a pathway there. You don't have to necessarily take that course, if, uh, but but you have to have some foundation. Right? We don't we don't have someone graduate the academy and, all right, now you're a homicide detective. There's, there's levels to uh, get to. I will tell you this, though, having a, a, a mind that thinks through things, but the best asset for a homicide detective is knowing how to talk to people, to being able to sit down and have a conversation and talk to people, but also listen. And not just, like we talked about this a little bit earlier today, not just hear what they say, but hear, feel what they're saying, understanding what they're saying, and creating an environment where people feel like they can open up and trust you and talk to you. Uh, I, I think that is, is undoubtedly the best asset for any detective, and really in law enforcement, because we, so much of what we do is, is interacting with people. Someone that will tell you where the murder weapon is, or someone that will come forward and tell you what actually happened, or a witness who trusts you enough to tell you where the, what the situation is. Those, those things are beneficial. Uh, any updates on offering a, a concealed weapon class and offering a portion of that class? Oh, wow, this is a little bit here. It, protected by law, where they are protected by law to shoot back when a citizen cannot shoot back. To refresh your memory, I mentioned explain the class of family attended in Gloucester County that was offered by the Sheriff's Department. They taught this topic as part of their uh, class on citizens need to be informed and properly educated as the rights and how they can pr protect themselves. So many citizens don't understand when they can legally shoot back or, or not shoot back. So we do have a Citizens Academy that will probably touch base a little bit on that. It sounds like to me, though, you were asking, is there a specific class that is structured around that that the police department would teach? I can tell you right now, we don't have we don't have that. Maybe if you could send me some information what they did. Um, I'm assuming you attended or know someone that attended or just know about the class in Gloucester. If you could maybe email us uh, a link or send us some information about what the Gloucester department. I know the, I know the sheriff out there well. Um, but if you send us some information, we can take a look at it. Uh, we talk about um, use of force. Uh, we talk in a citizens academy uh, use of force um, uh, tactics. We talk about self defense. We self self defense um, appropriate, not appropriate. Uh, able to walk away from a scene, not creating exigent circumstances, those type things. So, um, but it sounds like to me we would just touch on it in the citizens academy a variety of things. It sounds like to me you're looking for a full structure class. Um, so it would be something we could look at, but I just maybe send me a link. But we don't have anything like that right now that the police department uh, that teaches. I don't know if our sheriff's office does that, but it's again, maybe if I knew what exactly Gloucester did, uh, it might help a little bit. Uh, Linda, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Yep, I'm doing good. It's been a, a long day, but that's all right. The long days are, are sometimes the best days. So we've got a lot accomplished today. and. Um, putting things in place, moving forward, making sure we've got some things covered. So it's been a, it's okay. Um, thank you for being so active in the community. I live in Hampton, and I still keep up with everything. You you have great ways of connecting. Well, I appreciate that. I won't hold it against you that you live in Hampton. I'm just playing. I'm just playing. Hampton is, is uh, my friends. Uh, I have a good relationship with Chief Talbot, and um, 
No, so I, I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, the, um, I think, you know, having that relationship with community is important. Open lines of communication, I think being, uh, for me, right, for me, I'm not, no one else, for this department, I think being open and transparent is valuable. If we, you know, I've said before, we make mistakes, and when we do, we got to own that, admit that, and, and maybe try to even explain, um, you know, what some people feel like my perception, why did this happen? Well, there's a reason behind it. Why haven't you done this? Well, here's the reason. All oh, that makes sense. So I think, I think a lot of things can be cleared up by communication and just both parties being able to, to sit down and have that. There was an individual that was a little frustrated earlier in the, uh, the afternoon session and uh, said he'd been trying to get a hold of me. I called him right after and, and he's like, you know, Chief, that makes sense. So, but it's all right, you know, it's important that we have those conversations. And that, that is in essence why, why we're doing what we're doing here. Uh, Joyce, uh, Water Team Incorporated has been trying to get in touch with you. He said he left his number but never received a call back. So I know that we, if it's the group I think about, I'm thinking about, I think my assistant called them or there was some email exchange back and forth, but we have, um, and we might have met at an event, but I'm not sure that's the same group. So I don't want to, I don't want to say that wrong, um, but I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Is it, that, is that like a search, a search group? Uh, if it is, I, I think we met, but we have not said that had a follow up meeting. We met at an event in the city center. And then I think there might have been some email exchange between uh, my assistant, but, uh, but we haven't had a, a follow-up meeting trying to get that, that scheduled, if I'm talking about the right group. So I'm going down to Kim. Uh, yes, searching student, searching students at Woodside today. Yeah, I, I, I don't, are you sure? So, so Kim, I'll say this. I know there were some calls at schools uh, yesterday that were false calls about possibly someone with a firearm or something going on in the school. Uh, but it hit several of the cities uh, in our region and some outside of our region. I have not heard about an incident at Woodside today. Uh, I don't know if that was, if you can share a little bit more with me and maybe I can text our, our, our Captain Smith and ask him, but um, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly what, what you're referencing about Woodside. Um, if it was something that, if it was something though that I think in, that the that parents needed to know about, I, I would imagine the schools would send that out. But I'm just not sure exactly the topic or what the what the situation was. Logan, Logan, man, I was just talking about you. Uh, uh, um, yeah, so so uh, Logan, uh, please uh, tell me if I'm wrong. But you know, just our conversation. That you had some questions earlier. Um, um, took your number down and called you and we had really we had a good conversation and I appreciate you uh, one for posting that sharing that we talked but I appreciate the conversation on the phone and, and I understand your point I felt like you understood where I was trying to get across and it was it was a it was a, a really a really good conversation so so thank you my friend uh, our daughter's in middle school and is, exci is excited to serve as a young adult police commissioner what age or grade uh, must the student be in to join YAPC as an active member? It's still a rule that he must wait the ninth grade to serve. Our son, Abdallah, is YAPC alumni. Oh, yeah, I know all about my friend Abdallah and his sister that's having to join. So, um, young adult police commissioners or YAPC, that's a group of students. It's a freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior from every high school in the city. And we meet with that group. So, uh, six high schools, six plus fours, 24 students. We ended up somehow with 28 last year. I don't know how they swung that past me, but we had 20, 28 great youth of our city. We meet with them every Wednesday, and we have good conversations about what they look for in policing, what they want from their school system, what they want from their elected officials, what they're looking for to happen in their city. Um, some of them go with me to meet city council and the mayor. Uh, they will do press conferences with me. They will go on community walks with the police department. They do a lot of volunteer work. We have a lot of discussions about diversity and equity. Uh, we have a lot of talk about teen violence or, or uh, whether it's groups or gangs or, or shootings. Uh, why someone, why we see some of these events taking place with such younger and younger people. Um, so it is a great group, but we do use freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior. We feed them. The days of dominoes are gone. Everything seems to be around Chick-fil-A. I think we brought in Little Caesars one time. They looked at us like we were, ah! um, but it is a great group of people and it is really a way for the police department to bridge the gap with youth and bring youth to the conversation. In fact, that's their slogan. 
Uh, they even did a TV series for a while where the youth did interviews. Uh, but it is a great group. We'll been, spend time at the food bank in our communities. And, um, you know, some of them have known individuals that have been touched by violence or domestic violence. But all those topics we talk about and have very, very candid conversations. A lot of times the media, uh, the media outlets, whether it's Channel 3, 13, or 10, will work with us and do some question and answer. They'll work with the youth about how to do interviews. Uh, but we, we interact with them a lot. And I will tell you, uh, a situation that happened at one of our schools last year, uh, before I talked to the media, uh, I asked those students, and we met in a room, and I shared with them before I talked to anybody about the media and wanted, and I think that's being transparent with them about what had happened at, at one of our schools and, and why, how it, what it, how it laid out and, and what our response was. Uh, and then when we went down and did the press conference, they were in the room with me. So I, I think those things matter. Uh, that the youth are the best investment I think we can make. That's our future. They drive me crazy sometimes, but that's our future. And I really, really enjoy interacting with that. And, and some have gone on to join the police department in a couple of different fashions. And some are very, there's an alumni group that still kind of hang together. And, uh, but I love those kids and, and they're just a huge impact on the department, on me and the city and community. And they do phenomenal, phenomenal work. So, let me see, uh, uh, Jerry, are schools being inspected by NMPD and suggestions as needed to better secure? Uh, so I will tell you, we did a lot of that at the beginning of the year in the summer. Um, we did uh, active shooter training or craze training for all the schools. Uh, I should say middle and high school. I think some of the elementary might have been invited, but I know we did middle and high school. We have an SRO in every school, our uh, high school and, and, and middle school. And we talked about uh, Dr. Parker and, and the school staff there, we have a great relationship. I know they came up with strategies, things that they want to do, presented that to the school system. We've done the same thing, uh, working on some uh, additional through technology, right? Through technology that will help us respond to uh, uh, the things that officers might be able to see on their phone before they ever get to the parking lot or to the school. We've had really good conversations about how we're going to manage large sporting events. So. There is constant conversation, and we're always looking at ways to do better and improve. So uh, to answer your question, yes, and it goes both ways. What the schools recommended to us, what we recommend to them, and, and how do we work together. A lot of it is about information sharing. You know, if, if a student or a parent sees something on social media, some threat that's posted, and they share that information, how are schools getting that information to us? How are we getting that information to the schools? If there's some type of altercation in the schools that we worry about spilling out into the community, or something that happens in the community we're worried about spilling out to the schools or something god forbid some tragedy happens that affects uh, family members or individuals that have that attend that school uh, that we're able to share that information so a lot of it is those communication um, interacting with one another it's, it's us going to basketball and, and football games and, and concerts and, and just interacting with our youth building those bridges and relationships i think is important uh, to share share information and, and, and I just see that growing and growing and growing. Uh, Lucas, I watched your officers investigate a fatal crash at Jefferson and Habersham on the 27th. It sounds like street cars gone wrong. What is being done about the Saturday night street racing? So, yep, uh, you're absolutely right on the, that's kind of what the situation was on the 27th. I know there was, uh, they, they found a group of cars. So there's what's what we're seeing in the area is individuals getting together that has these fancy cars or souped up cars uh, and going to locations and, and you may see some of it in social media, but racing up and down the street or doing donuts. And I think uh, they found a location last week where that was going on. There were about 30 vehicles. I think we stopped about 14 or 15, wrote several summonses, uh, but I'm not, I'm not opposed if we have to, to tow those vehicles. I think we send a strong message. People get hurt with that. Uh, not only citizens, right, who are driving home or driving from point A to point B and that stuff coming down, but the individuals partaking in it. Um, we had that situation uh, where it ended up in a death where the car literally exploded because of the impact it had. Um, so, yeah, it's trying to stay ahead of it, to hear where those things are occurring at. Sometimes there's some social media back and forth. Uh, but the seven cities, we've all kind of touched base on that, e even as far up as Richmond, um, looking at trying to get ahead of those those groups that travel and 
sometimes it's not like hey it just happens here uh it's one group from here it's groups from all over that meet in different low cities and localities so we try to share that information and interact with those individuals um, i have no problems with people parking and showing off their cars right they take great pride in that but if you put people's lives in danger including your own then then we have then we have some problems uh, Annie, uh, I live in the Denby area and of the city, and there has been a real problem on my street over the last few months. Is there a way to speak to you or maybe an email address I could send a letter to you? Thanks in advance. So, Annie, you can uh, you, you can do it through Messenger here on Facebook. You can email the police department just to, to me. Uh, but what I would do, first off, is I would probably send it to your – you can send it to me. That's fine. But I would send it to your precinct captain, Captain Cup, in the north part of the city. Uh, I know him. He is an outstanding captain. He's got a real heart for Denby. Uh, he's been in that area. He does a great job as the captain up there. There's sector lieutenants are responsible for particular neighborhoods or districts. So it's really narrowed down who's, who's accountable for what area. Uh, but, yeah, please feel free to send it to me. Um, you can write a letter. You can email whatever's best for you. Uh, but I, I would uh, read it, but I would be getting it to the, that precinct captain who we give him about 80 officers to uh, to address those situations and then report back. So, absolutely. Uh, any updates on communication with the city council about curbing panhandling? You know, uh, so I don't have any huge updates. I know there's ongoing conversation. Sometimes we get some areas. We try to move people along. It's not something that we're really trying to arrest people for. Um, We've talked a little bit about this before. Uh, sometimes it's individuals who are on hard times or they're homeless or struggling, uh, maybe some mental illness, but try to find what the cause is. Uh, I do get concerned when they're in the middle of the intersection, right? we got to move them there. I don't want them to get hit or cars stopping because they're in the middle of the road. Um, so, yeah, so, but there hasn't been, I don't, I mean, I don't have anything brand new to share. I think it's just responding to some of those locations. There's been some success stories with some getting them hooked up with services. We have a day reporting center, uh, Four Oaks, that deals with uh, training and resources and services uh, for individuals in need. Um, so it's kind of responding to it. Um, one of the, a couple years ago, we had some, like we'll, we'll focus on some intersections where we have heavy traffic accidents. And for the year, We'll do heavy traffic enforcement and that to try to decrease accidents. One of the things we could look at is where are some of the intersections where we're seeing a lot of panhandling um, in areas that can cause accidents or injury, but it's aggressive panhandling, and, and, and try to focus on that and address that. So I say that, say, if you have a particular location, if you're just asking in general, that's fine, but if you have a particular location, if you mess or mess, messenger us, uh, that's something that we can take a look at and sign someone directly to to keep an eye on it. Keith, I uh, hope all is well. Talking about you today to the lieutenant in our training academy up here. Uh oh, uh, she was asking me for recommendations for deputies to become general instructors. I suggested deputies speak Spanish so he could teach other deputies. I told her about your requirement to have a percentage of new recruits. Oh wow! So how did it go over when you when you talked about our uh, requirement? So what my friend Keith is talking about is um, uh, we have a large uh, uh, Spanish-speaking population. Uh, so we have, a couple years ago, we decided that we wanted to hire a certain portion of our academy, our recruits, right, that came into the department speaking Spanish. Now, I know that creates some, you know, uh, if we recruit heavily, um, some individuals who speak Spanish might not speak English as well. We'll work with that. But I think it's important that we're able to communicate so um, we, we now have the 10% of our academy has to speak Spanish, 10% of the individuals in our recruits. Now, I would say that for the most part, we're blowing that out of the water, right? We're getting uh, 25%. They come in and speak. We average about 25 to start a class. Uh, but it's important. I think it's been paid off. And then we're even uh, in other aspects, not positions that aren't even sworn, right? People in records or division or police aides. That's been very, very beneficial. Uh, dispatchers looking to hire dispatchers who can speak. However, I will tell you, there are some software out there. In, there is some software out there. Uh, one from California that we looked at that does, uh, and I don't want to say it wrong, but I think that 
an individual can talk into their cell phone and it will translate in English to dispatchers and dispatchers can type back or translate back in their cell phone it'll it will translate it into whatever whatever language not just Spanish I think it's like 160 some languages or 127 languages uh, but we're very again right technology what can we do bigger and better and that's something that we're looking at there's a couple departments that have it we sent one of our uh, Laura one of the best that we have uh, uh, to a conference she saw this and thought it'd be very beneficial she brought it back we've already had a presentation and something that we're looking at doing for our, for our dispatchers that's important that we can communicate um, effectively with individuals who live in our city um, thanks for telling me about the the process to get to the hot I'll catch you we oh Anna did I miss Anna mm -hmm. Anna how are you glad you're here um, thanks tell me about the process to get to the homicide I'll call and schedule a meeting with you or phone to talk about more I don't know if, if you know but Joe Kenda was a lieutenant in homicide in Colorado Springs I do I've met him a couple times he saw it about I saw that he's not retired himself it's truly what inspired me yeah I uh, I got to see him uh, in March a couple times speak at a couple police events uh, very very interesting uh, uh, individual very talented world of, world of knowledge and and I will tell you it's just crazy the advances so I've been doing this about 30 years and and you know it went from being able to talk to people and that's still I think still the foundation but technology and all the things that are out there being able to tap into cameras uh, I won't give away all the secrets right but it is just amazing um, out there forensics uh, when I started here we had five forensic technicians we're now we now have 10 positions for that and I just think that so much of that is, is just so technological and I'm so impressed with the work that that they do but yes it's it just it, it, it's interesting and you try to determine theories and what happened and why what was the motive uh, there's just a lot of things that go into it and those are very very complex investigations uh, we try to staff our department that way a uh, rule of thumb the last that I saw was about one homicide detective can handle about three cases a year uh, it, it's kind of best practice that's, that's putting the case together uh, doing the interviews keeping witnesses on board providing the the case of the Commonwealth attorney working hand-in-hand -hand with the Commonwealth attorney to present uh, a case before a judge or a jury uh, so we average uh, our average of around 25 to 30 homicides a year if I go back about the last 10 years and look at that collectively so we have 10 homicide detectives that's what we're allotted and then we have uh, eight aggravated assault detectives that just focus on shootings and stabbings and bad assaults or bad beatings so that they each kind of can focus on what's theirs and not get overburdened with all these different cases it's important that we do our best to solve those and call that our clearance rates I'm glad to say that our clearance rates here and larcenies and robberies and rapes and homicides are well above the national average uh, I, my, our goal is to solve each solve each and every one I know I'm realistic that that doesn't always happen but we still going to put forth the effort um, I think it doesn't bring any lost one back but it provides some closure and some answers so yeah Michael um, how do we get police officers out there on the corner of Temple and Allen Road tired of people fly, flying down Temple in the morning when children are out there to catch the bus so Michael I will tell you um, Temple South. South Precinct so you know one of the things is your, your, your post here if you but if you could tell me, is it like every day, a certain day of the week, a certain time frame, um, we can try to do some traffic enforcement. Sometimes we'll we'll put um, specific overtime positions. You know what? For this week, we want to focus on traffic, or this week, we want to focus on maybe panhandling. But traffic enforcement is something that probably the number one complaint I get around is, Chief, we don't see enough traffic enforcement. And I just want to be transparent with you. We're always going to focus our research. The most of our our main focus is always going to be on violent crime making sure that our communities and neighborhoods are safe um, and, and traffic enforcement it has to be something that can't just go out once a once in a while it's something we have to be do consistently it's something I'd like to increase um, we have two academies in we have one that graduates in November another one that graduates in January we're starting to or February we're starting to hire for the Academy that will start in January but uh, if that's a location that that you're seeing a lot of issues um, please let me know 
let us know. I'd like to know a little bit more about time frame and days of the week, or if it's every day. And um, uh, you know that there are cameras. I don't know if you know that there are cameras on buses that if if you see cars passing a bus that's stopped, um, that that that's a pretty hefty fine. We have someone that watches those camera systems and validates that. But uh, yeah, good. Just let just let me know, and we'll kind of we'll kind of go from there. Uh, did I, Bridget, hey Chief, good. Bridget, it's good to hear from you. Thanks for being here. Hope all is well. Uh, Angela, the Citizen Police Academy is awesome. I encourage everyone to take the time to attend. That sheds a whole new light on what our officers have to deal with daily. Uh, thank you, Chief, for the opportunity you gave us citizens to participate. And a great big thank you for all the officers and their sector. So, uh, Angela, thank you. That means a lot. Let me just uh, just take a minute. Uh, what she's talking about is our Citizens Academy. Uh, it's about eight, nine, ten weeks. Uh, where Monica White and others just do a phenomenal job. And what we do is we bring citizens in in the evening um, and I have about a two-hour session, and some of us go a little longer when I'm talking. I just get into it, right, and we start asking questions. And, but um, we really open the doors to the department. We, we talk about use of force. We talk about forensics. We talk about homicide investigations. We talk about how we recruit. We talk about... Um, uh, how we interact with youth, how we, our foundation culture about community policing we we talk about uh how we uh, officer development uh, but it really kind of exposes the department uh what probable cause is what's it mean and then once you graduate that academy there are a lot of times that i will ask you to come back and help us whether it's serving on our our use of force review board or in role play or we do active shooter drills um, or, or dui enforcement and dui uh, training so it's just a great opportunity to learn about the department um, and, and just experience some of the things that we do. You can even do ride-alongs if that's something that you're interested in. Uh, but I really appreciate citizens who take the time. You really get an inside look at, at what it's like in law enforcement and, and the job that we do uh, do today. Um, I'm with you from Norfolk. I wish you could be our <laughs> in Norfolk, huh? Well, well Bridget, I appreciate that. Uh, I know uh, Interim Chief Goldsmith very well. Uh, I talked a lot to uh, Chief Boone uh, when he was there, so uh, I, appre I appreciate you joining us, and uh, uh, thank you for all you do. I think I'm going to be over there uh, doing some things with some regional chiefs, so uh, maybe we can catch up, or, or please stay in touch, and, and we'll, we'll talk more. But uh, it's good to have you here tonight. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Joyce, yes, that is them. Um, I tried to spell that. Yeah, I, Joyce, is that talking about the car racing or uh, the accident or the bus stop thing? But I just want to make sure I'm getting the right the right response there. Oops. It's okay. We're, all right, so um, go a little bit more. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, hey, Chief, is there any way you can do something about people bag, begging, bagging, begging for money? It's like getting crazy out there. So I will tell you, if you let us know the area, uh, we try to, try to, especially the aggressive panhandling, we'll try to address fairly quickly. I, we talked to this a little bit just a few minutes ago that, you know, it's not individuals that we want to arrest. It's not who we're trying to put in jail. We try to move them along or find out what the situation is or the cause, whether it's, you know, homeless, if, it, if it's a mental illness type thing, if it's people down on their luck or struggling or whatever it might be. Uh, but the aggressive one, the aggressive uh, panhandling is something that we that we will try to address pretty quickly. So if there's uh, in route, right, it's got to be so we have to stay on it. But I see some individuals that used to panhandle a lot in the south that we moved, and I just see them progressing up in, and now in the northern part of the city. Uh, Joyce was, I think Joyce is talking about yes. the, the group. Yeah, gotcha. Um, but yeah, so if you can just let us know, maybe email us in about a location you're talking about. On the aggressive panhandling, we'll we'll, uh, we'll try to, to address that. I can send that to the pre precinct captain as well. Anything you can elaborate on related to the city intelligence team and projects that will help in investigations, etc. So the city's intelligence team. Uh, give me a definition. We may be talking about something with different name. I'm just not sure exactly. Um, so I, I will share with you a little bit. That we have more crime analysts, I think, than just about anybody in the area. Uh, and I'm looking, uh, we have a crime analyst in homicide and an aggravated assault. We have a crime crime analyst in each of our precincts. We have a 
a crime analyst in a real-time crime center. We have a crime analyst for our gang department. We have a crime analyst for our narcotics division. Um, and we're looking at, we're talking about, Captain Smith has made some very good points, uh, looking to have a crime analyst in, uh, that deals with our community youth and outreach for our school resource officers, right, and issues that we have on, on calls that are, uh, are threats made. Just how do we get a, even a quicker response if there's something on social media about um, uh, threats to a school or threats to an individual or something along those lines. So something that we're, we're trying to focus on and, and, and increase. I just think that bringing that more and more intelligence in to the department is very beneficial in how we tap into other resources. So, uh, Bridget, um, some people are desperate and need honesty. Yeah, Bridget, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and, and so I think it's incumbent uh, I, I'm very, really, very careful about lumping, you know, all people are just panhandling it. You know, there are vast reasons. Uh, and I think spending the time and getting to know what those situations are is, is beneficial, trying to address the root cause. Um, and, and I will tell you, look, I, there are some that, that are down on their luck, that are really struggling. There are some, I think, the mental illness, homeless. There are some that, that do try to take advantage of other people. Uh, but it's trying to figure out what that is and, and then to address it. and pointed in the right direction. But it's complex. It's absolutely complex. Linda, Chief, I had a, a black car come up behind me in Killen Creek and go beside me. All the windows were so heavily tinted. We know that's an issue. Uh, you could not see anyone inside. It was very unnerving. Is there a tent limit for windows? Yes, there is There is a tent limit. Some officers will carry tent meters. They're able to shine a percentage of light through that. Um, you know, was the driver act driving uh, aggressively, or was it just it was just you kind of freaked out a little bit because the car was so uh, uh, black, blacked out? But I, I can understand, and I'll tell you this, Linda. If there's a traffic stop at night and a vehicle has those windows that are that are very tinted, um, it's a concern to officers as well. Some people get upset that we shine a flashlight into the car, but it's, we just want to see who we're stopping or who we're interacting with, and it may be nothing that. Hey, your light, your, you don't have any lights on in the middle of the night, or somebody went through a red light, or uh, you're weaving, whatever might, whatever the stop might be for, but being able to look through there. So I know how that feels. I just didn't know in your situation, was it just I saw the car and it surprised me how dark the windows were, or was it aggressive, aggressive driving? Um, that's true. It's kind of scary when you get to the store and you come out and they look at you like sometimes they, they follow you to your car. Talking about panhandling, you think? And, and you know, it, it's funny. Scroll back up for me just a minute. Um, true, very scary. So I'm going right under Bridget now. So, uh, and I'll tell you, I've gotten some recent complaints or concerns, maybe is a better word, some recent concerns about individuals on business lots that as you come out of a store or a grocery store that will follow you and, and interact with you. I, I haven't, I don't know of any, I haven't, I don't recall any assaults that I've heard. Uh, but just people asking for help, and, and so I can I can under, I can understand that. Um, okay, thank you for the information and help. Are you going to be taking donations again for Domestic Violence Month and Listen? Yes, absolutely. So there's a couple of things I want to make sure that I touch base on before we get off here tonight. Uh, but I'm willing I'm willing to spend some time. Um, but yes, Domestic Violence Month is next month. Uh, we will be taking donations. I think we're putting boxes out uh, again. Uh, and I'll tell you, I, I still learn a lot uh, from the domestic violence team. You know, I didn't realize how important pampers were uh, for those that might be going through a situation with domestic violence. But that, that uh, hygiene products, but pampers are, uh, are such a, a huge commodity. We did a domestic violence interview today, uh, myself and, and Ms. Shavers, with our domestic violence team, and we just talked about the need and so yes we absolutely will be taking donations and then we'll have a get together they look they make fun of me they said chief we're going to have a wrap party uh, about and then wrap all the, these up and decorate boxes to, to put out to do collections for donations and i said rap party music to and they're like no chief not music rap like wrap the boxes or containers so yeah um, show my age i guess but absolutely michael every Oh, okay, Michael, so that's the talk about the, the, the speeding. Gotcha, gotcha. We'll make a note of that. I'll get that to the precinct captain and see if we can focus on that a little bit. Uh, but thank you. That time frame helps us a lot. I appreciate that. 
Keith, lots of questions about traffic issues and racing. Have you been able to hire enough to get your traffic unit back from patrol? So right now, um, what happened with some of the shortages we had, we, we had to put our traffic division into patrol. I will tell you, Keith, uh, we've got individuals hired, but we still got to get through these two academies to get them to graduate. We have one academy of about 20 that will graduate in November and another group of about 20 that will graduate in February. Uh, we're hiring for the academy in January that will graduate in what? Right in the summer, uh, around July. So our goal is to put about 30 in that class. But right now, our track division is still absorbed into patrol, uh, and, and it will stay there until we get until we get enough bodies in there to make sure that we're adequately, I, you know, making sure that we have enough people on the street to respond to calls in a timely manner. I don't want to short patrol. Uh, that's the backbone of, of any police department, making sure when someone dials 911 that we're responding. So right now they are still absorbed in, in, in patrol. But we have started looking at doing some uh, selective overtime enforcement, whether it's traffic, traffic checkpoints, DUI patrols, those type, type things to address specific needs in a specific location. Uh, Deborah, thank you, Deborah, thanks for being here tonight. I appreciate that. Today would have been, wow. Yep, absolutely. You know what? Happy 80th birthday anyway. You know, um, just hold on to those memories, and I get it. I get it. Thank you for being here. Thanks for taking the time. Uh, Robin, uh, Robin, thank you for being here. It's good to hear from you. I hope all is well. Uh, yeah, yes, the, the water team, uh, sorry. No, no, don't apologize. Yeah, I did meet them at City Center. Did I was interested. I still have, I think they gave me some handouts that I still have. Uh, and I think we went back, and I think they went back and forth with some some uh, emails with my assistant. But I have not, we have not had a follow-up sit down and really talk about what they can bring to the table. I'm certainly not opposed to that. Uh, I think it's a good working relationship. Can be a, can be a good working relationship. Uh, um, how we can use some of their talent and resources and things that we can do. So I'm certainly open to that. We just got to get that meeting set. Um, well, Miss Neal, how are you? I hope you're doing well. It's good to have you here. Uh, it's been a while since I saw you, so it's good to, it's good to, good to have you on board, man. I hope things are going well. Um, the Citizen Police Academy is eight weeks. So Anna Whalen is one of our uh, uh, coordinators for volunteers with the department. Uh, she has a citizens alumni. So what happens is when you graduate the Citizens Police Academy, the same group gets back together and they do a lot of things in the community. They help with a lot of training, a lot of uh, community and social events uh, to help bridge the gap between police and, and citizens, right? So um, it does in eight weeks you can join the alumni. Yeah, so alumni, perfect, perfect. And uh, Chief, no matter what Norfolk offers you, say no. We need <laughs> Oh, look at you, and you, get, you guys get me in trouble. So we're going to scroll on past that. Uh, how do I get a police presence at 6.30 a.m. at my daughter's bus stop? I realize it's shift change, but these boys get in the road and try to take down signs and tear up the trees. Mostly I worry one of them is going to be getting hurt, but they are. Oh, you're talking about, you're not talking about traffic. You're talking about individuals. So, so Deborah, I'll, I'll tell you, and others that have talked in about uh, bus stops, we do not have enough officers to go to every bus stop in the city. We just don't. And we still got to respond to calls that come in. So there's a couple things. One, there's the police and there's also schools. If there's a problem at a bus stop, if you let us know, it's one that we can put on maybe a hot sheet or a list uh, that I can send to the precinct captain and that we can hit some of those periodically. I can't, I can't promise you that there will always be somebody available at a bus stop unless we're called there. Second, if it is something going on and you're there and you call the police, we can respond to it as a call for service. The third, if there's a problem at a bus stop, I'd also encourage you to reach out to the school system, to the transportation department, and let them know that that's an issue. They have individuals that can respond there uh, and address issues at the bus stop and the bus driver uh, sharing information. So those are the kind of the different ways we can address it, uh, and that's the way I would encourage you to, to go forward with that. Um, I absolutely one trip. Uh, you come All right, so we're going to skip the Norfolk stuff. Uh, Richard, cams and businesses, etc. Yes, yes. I think I know what you're saying. So yes, uh, Annie. Thank you. Uh, she passed on the 27th, and absolutely, and uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that it was a great. It was a great experience. The Citizens Academy. Yeah, I, I will tell you. Um, 
I, I got to meet the new group that's in there now, the new class, and I was supposed to talk 20 minutes. So I would love to say it was a citizen's ball, right? But I, yeah, bah. But we just had a great conversation, and, and they had to pull me out of there because we were just going on and on and on talking about um, questions and ideas and thoughts. And uh, there's a couple people uh, from some of the school system that are attending or friends now that I've got to interact with the kids at their school. So I was excited to see them. And it's just a great job. Monica, and she just does a phenomenal job. The, the uh, CPAAA, the alumni group with Anna, they just do an amazing job. You are extremely valuable to this department. Um, and it really helps us when we do issues with active shooter training or, or walks in the community or celebrations or uh, community cookout for uh, some of the, the different complexes around. So it's just val valuable. And again, they sit on our use of force review board and it helps us improve our department. So I'm very, very fortunate and thankful uh, to have those individuals attend the academy. And I believe that citizens get a lot out of it as well. They're not aggressive, just unnerving. I was wondering how our officers handled it. Oh, I got you. Yep, that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, Bridget, come on, Chief. The drive to Newport has got to come on your tires. Norfolk is where home is at. <laughs> Bridget, you're killing me. Uh, analytical software for, yes. So, Richie, I, I will tell you, there's all, I could talk 20 minutes just about what our analysts uh, things that they do that bring to the table. They're uh, all civilian except one, and and, and he, he has some uh, military uh, background. So it's very, very valuable, and they do a, just a phenomenal job. Um, Joyce, that's great. Yeah, please do. Uh, they may be a little frustrated. We haven't been able to get to sit down yet, but, but we just had some things. You know, if you follow the police department, there's been some cases that, that have pulled me away in some different directions. So, but I... I do look forward to talking to them, and I do think there's a way we can do some things together. Uh, Ms. Brumfield, yep, she was an uh, alumni of our Citizens Academy. E excellent. Keith, I know you're familiar with Virginia State Police Federal Agent Mike Walter. My charity is looking to award the first ever Mike. Wow. Wait, it's cool. i got to see that one. That's okay. Mike uh, Walter, Memorial Officer of the Year, award nomination is being taken until December 1st. So yeah, I'll definitely look into that. Mike Walter was a, a state trooper. Um, so before I came to Newport News, I spent 25 years in Richmond. I left there as an assistant chief, and um, um, uh, you know, uh, Mike was an individual that worked for the state police that lost his life in Richmond. Um, I was there at that scene in that investigation uh, at the time there, Chief Chief Durham, and um, so Keith, I, I think that's a great cause, and I'll certainly look it up, man. And if there's anything I can do to help out, I. Uh, Wow, that's a great cause. Uh, Christopher, uh, hey, Chief, it's nice seeing you at Denby Day Parade last Sunday. Chris, I appreciate that, man. I'll tell you what, I had, had a late night, uh, uh, fr Friday night. Uh, we got up at, uh, our briefing was around 7.30 in the morning to get prepared, and uh, I really, really enjoyed, uh, I had gone to a football game here at Todd Stadium uh, Saturday, uh, Friday night. And then we had the parade on Saturday. I had a great time interacting with kids and people in the parade. And then I uh, went to a football game uh, uh, after that. So I appreciate that, uh, my friend. It was, it was good. It was a good time. Uh, and it looked like citizens from all over the city came out to to enjoy it. So uh, it was good stuff. Uh, your, your wife must be very patient with you as much time as you spend at the community and responding to incidents. So I will tell you, just being open and transparent with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, being divorced, uh, I, I had a, a great marriage and a great relationship. Uh, we just kind of grew apart, and uh, she might agree with you back in the day. Uh, I don't know about how patient, but, um, but no, uh, we, we're divorced, uh, still the best of friends, and both she has moved on. Uh, both of us moved on with our life. She, uh, great, great individual, but uh, it's funny because <laughs> that post is, we certainly had a lot of comments about that. So we'll leave that there, Jerry. Uh, Keith, just help spread the word so we get, yeah, so Keith, I'll, I'll take a look at the website, kind of see what it's about. I, I, I remember the wrestling, uh, the wrestling side of in the history that he had there. So I, I remember that, you know, it, um, my, my, my time in Richmond, two, two state troopers um, lost their life in, in the 25 years that, 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 I, that I worked there. And, 
Yeah. So I think it's a great cause, Keith. I appreciate that. We all caught up, Sarah? Mm-hmm. There's a couple things I want to hit on and just share with you. This is Suicide, suicide Prevention and Awareness Month. Tomorrow in our city, right here in Newport News, at 6 p.m. at First Baptist Church, a uh, phenomenal church, great community partner, great police partners. At the intersection of Warwick and City Center, we've got a list of three or four speakers that are going to come and talk a little bit about suicide prevention. And not only do I think it's important in our field or things that officers see and are exposed to, but you never know what someone is going through, right? So, um, and, and all of us are human. This badge and patches don't make us any different than anyone else. It certainly doesn't make us any better. Um, but it, we do are exposed to some things and see some of the things in society I wish no one ever had to respond to or see. Uh, so Sarah and others in our department uh, uh, have, have put together a, uh, a suicide aware pro- program. Uh, it's just really some conversation. And people are going to talk a little bit. We have some veteran, a veteran that's going to speak, and some other individuals. Um, you know, it's important. Our mental health is important. You just never know what someone might be going through or something that just pushes someone over the edge or someone who might contemplate those thoughts or has been. And and I would just say this. This month being Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, there are people who care. There are people who care about you. Uh, You're valued, right? And it may just give some tips about how to interact, how to have conversations, how to listen, um, how to be there, offer resources that are out there. So if you... If you're free, it's open to the public. It's open to law enforcement across the region. It's open to citizens, uh, employers and employees, businesses. But at 6 6 p.m. at First Baptist Church, three or four speakers. It's not going to be a long event, but it's going to be interactive. And I would encourage you uh, to stop by and attend. I'd love to see you there. Um, uh, We've talked about our our two police academies that are uh, getting ready to graduate. Uh, But we also have a dispatcher academy i got to meet them today uh we went over and had some fun interacted with them I, I believe they should be considered first responders for the work that they do they save lives they save our lives and they they keep order uh and are able to calm people down and calm officers down who get ratcheted up on a call or we may be going to with violence or people screaming in need of help whatever it might be uh, they just do phenomenal i'm excited for the new individuals that are going through that uh, Val and, and Laura do a great job in, in teaching and training them, um, and they're valuable members of this department. Uh, and I'm thankful for our, our men and women who go into dispatching. Uh, it is a hard job. It is a stressful job, but it is extremely rewarding, and I appreciate them. So I want to just share that with you. I want to share that with you that we're always hiring in the department. Um, like I said, we're looking for a new academy in January, so we're starting to hire for that. Um, that we're routinely hiring, and there's all kinds of positions, not just sworn, there's also civilian, whether it's dispatchers or in our records division, if you want to be a police officer, um, the different uh, police aides, there's just different uh, functions that we have. I'd love for you to look at our website, or if you're concerned, you reach out to us, I'll get you in touch with a recruiter and just talk to you about different things that we have. Uh, but we're always looking for good people to serve this, this community, and I'm looking for people I'm trying to bring into this department are, are those that think outside the box or creative. We can't police the same way we did in 1985. I'm looking for people who have a heart for service, who care about others. Um, last two things I want to touch base on, then we're going to go back and, and hit these. Um, this is Recruit Community Week. So this is the week we take our recruits, our 20 recruits that are learning how to be police officers and the culture of policing, how to write reports and do traffic stops and interact with citizens and and investigate crime scenes. Uh, we, we put the computers away, the notes away, we shut the PowerPoints down, and we take them out into the community. So Pastor Cheeks and others work with our recruits, whether they're interacting with individuals who are homeless or suffer drug drug addiction, uh, whether they're interacting with our youth at our schools, seeing them get on the bus, off the bus, interacting with them at their elementary schools, uh, interacting with those at Boys and Girls Club, a community garden, uh, walking in a community and interacting. What we're trying to do and show the practical side, the humanity side of community policing, uh, how important our citizens and our youth are. And we can teach that and talk about it in the classroom, but I think it adds a lot of value of taking individuals out and put them in the community and let them see, let them interact with neighborhoods and entities that they're going to be working with. So that's going on this week. And I think somebody pointed out already before I even mentioned it, 
um, next month in October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So take a look at our, the, the, the police department here. We're going to light our building up in purple. Uh, and, and domestic violence is something very near and dear to me. Uh, we created, I wanted a domestic violence unit. Uh, we've done that. Uh, we're still learning and tweaking it to try to make it the best we can. But you've got a great team. Um, and, and we see that other crimes are associated with domestic violence. But it's also about opening up and sharing and providing resources and getting them hooked up with the right individuals, the right groups, the right entities that provide service. Whether it's a, a private group or a church or whatever, or whatever it might be, um, but we'll be doing things all the whole month long. We have a couple of vehicles that are, are wrapped, meaning that they are painted with domestic violence logo and awareness. We're doing some uh, domestic violence overtime and communities where officers uh, driving those domestic violence cars will be the ones to respond to domestic violence calls for service. Uh, but it's just important, um, and I, you know, I, I, I dealt with a situation just earlier today before I came in here. And uh, so, yes, it, um, uh, Suicide Prevention Month is September and Domestic Violence Month October. And again, I hope to see some people at the Suicide Awareness Conversation tomorrow at, at uh, First Baptist Church there at Warwick and City Center. I want to go back here, uh, Bridget. Uh, I've always been for policing, but you take it to another level. Be, being involved in the community like you do is very much noticed. Um, well, well, Bridget, I don't know if everybody agree with you about being great at what I do, uh, but I will tell you, um, I'm not in this job to get rich. I've been doing it almost 30 years. People helped me as I was coming up, whether it was a uh, there were certainly officers that I knew, but but whether it was a coach or a youth pastor or a mentor or a teacher, uh, uh, someone on a particular block where I lived or would hang out and play. Um, and so I do believe that this job is about service. Uh, it's, it's a heavy commitment. It takes you away from some other things. Um, you see a lot of bad, but you have the opportunity and the ability to do a lot of good. Some things you don't realize the impact you have on somebody's life until five or six later, years later they call and tell you, I remember how you helped me with that situation, uh, how you talked to me, how you interacted with me. So, um, yeah, I, I appreciate that. But I, I will tell you this. I am humbled and honored to work with such great men and women in this organization. Uh, I see what, what they miss. I see the commitment they have. I see the extra shifts that they cover. I see the forensic technicians and the time they spend at processing a crime scene or uh, individuals that go through the academy and their physical uh, challenges that, that they take part there and learning as much as they can. I see um, officers that spend extra time in field training and working with new recruits. Um, I see how case detectives, whether it's aggravated assault, special victims who process and deal with some of the most heart-wrenching cases you can imagine, homicide detectives who take it home and sometimes we have to make them leave. They'll stay here 48 hours when they're following things. Uh, I'm just honored to work with such great men and women, sworn and civilian, both dispatchers who will pick up after extra shifts to stay late, come in early. Um, it is a family. We don't always agree. And we don't always get it right. We make mistakes. I make plenty of them. But men and women who join this profession across the country, but especially here in Newport News, they matter to me. It's not just a code number. They matter to me. The sacrifice they make to serve the citizens, the citizens of this city, they matter to me, and I appreciate it. Um, just joined on these updates on Jane. I just joined on this. Is there, uh, Adam? So no, we talked about it a little bit earlier. That's a missing person. I got a little bit of brief before I came in here. Some leads they were following, some information they were trying to track down, uh, some some uh, connections they were trying to make, uh, but nothing nothing to really push forward at this point. Uh, Linda, thank you. I appreciate you, and thank you for the prayers. I'll take every one. Keith, have a great night. You too, my friend. Please be safe. Anna, th uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you, Anna, as well. Just, uh, it's okay. Just Keith on dispatchers. The true first responders. Keith, I agree. Uh, Anna, have a good night. Go home and get some rest, and don't, and don't forget to eat. Sarah, thank you. Yeah, Sarah did keep me straight. And look, Anna, I didn't touch anything, right? She's got it all under control. Uh, Chris, any update on the Erie Lewis case uh, by chance? Chris, I'm going to 
I, you know, I will give you an update on that. Adam, thank you. I appreciate you, my friend. Um, yeah, so, Chris, yeah, it is an active case, but let me share some things with you. Um, Friday, last Friday, uh, we had got some, we got some information in the middle of the week. Uh, we put together two large search parties. Uh, we used dogs and, and, and uh, drones. We had about 75 individuals uh, from our recruit class to all of our homicide, our major crimes division, the chief, the assistant chiefs. Um, we were in some areas that were, you know, I, I don't want to say we put people in harm's way, but there were some tough areas that we walked through. Um, and, and I will tell you, uh, I was a little down. Uh, we were all excited. Um, we got out there about, started around 6.37 in the morning. Uh, and we did two large areas at one time. And we had had some information come in. We made some things happen uh, fairly quickly. All the stars lined up. Uh, we were able to get everyone that we needed uh, into a methodical search. Uh, regrettably, uh, it was, well, we didn't have the results that we were hoping for. Um, uh, we had to get out of there and get, get our shower and get cleaned up. Um, but I'll tell you some things happened. So to answer your question directly, uh, uh, we did two large scale searches at two locations in our city on Friday. And we called the family before and after. Um, but I'll tell you, we used some of our recruits there were two comments. One recruit said, Chief, um, they didn't want to leave. And they, do they need us at the other scene? We're willing to go there. And after they had been through what we had put them through, and, and myself going through it with them, uh, the areas that we were going to searching, right? Um, one, of the, one of the recruits said, Chief, would you please have a detective come to our academy class and update us on this case? They took interest. And, and that is the type of individuals that I want in this organization that care about other people, um, what what they did and what the officers did. And I saw some frustration on the detective's part, but it doesn't change. Uh, we just uh, regroup, go back over a timeline, go back over some of the information we have and, and try to piece some things together. But uh, that's probably the best update I can give you. Uh, but I did want to, you brought that up. And I did have that down here to share if we had some time. So I appreciate that quick question. Uh, Jerry, thank you. And uh, uh, it's mutual. Um, I think we're blessed in this city. I think that this department has a, a great relationship with our community, our faith leaders, our businesses, our school system. You know, look, I can tell you, we do not always get it right. We make mistakes, but it is the drive and effort to try to make things better, to improve the quality of life for our citizens in this city, to invest in our youth, to reduce crime, to solve those cases and try to prevent uh, incidents from occurring. The main thing that we do is provide a service to our citizens. Uh, and this job gives us the opportunity to do that daily. And I do not take the position that I sit in. I do not take it lightly, and I am thankful. I, I tell uh, Ms. Cindy Roth, our manager, city manager, thank you for this opportunity to serve the citizens of this community. Uh, and I, I think I want to – forensic technicians, our, 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 our dispatchers, our, our sworn officers that work midnight shift for most of us – are home asleep, and those that work on the weekends, or detectives in all different branches, our traffic guys, canine, all the different things, the guys that patrol the water, just all that you do, I appreciate you. And I have not forgotten that this is, am I correct, Sarah, National Forensic Science Week. And I believe that the forensic technicians we have are some of the most talented people. And how they do what they do, the technology they have, how they determine this and that trajectory, and let me just tell you, we're blessed to have them. So I'm going to get out of here. Uh, it's time to go working overtime, and I yeah, and I got you. Thanks for looking out for me. Uh, yes, they're a great recruit, recruit, recruitee. I appreciate that, Mr. Brown. Listen, please be safe. Sorry for going over. I really appreciate the interaction. Um, be safe, and we'll do this again next month. Some of you, those that had direct questions or callbacks or set up meetings appointments, just email me and. And we'll go from there. Chris, thank you, my friend. I appreciate you. God bless.